ladies and gentlemen, Pat Kelly. Uh, so you already already heard who I am. Um, I would like to point out that this is the 40th year for our organization in the corridor. Um, and that gives us a kind of a historical viewpoint that many other people can't have. Uh, what we'd like to present to you today is primarily uh, a, a kind of a detailed viewpoint of what's going on in each community, uh, residentially, uh, as well as commercially in a small way. And we're not going to drill down to the very essence of what a house on uh, 1234 Easy Street is worth, but we will talk about trends for sure. Uh, and what I'd like you to go away from this with is some sense of what's going on throughout the corridor and where we stack up both uh, amongst ourselves between Pemberton, Whistler and, and uh, Squamish, but also vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, a question I get all the time is where do we stand relative to the U.S. resorts and our peer group? Um, and so I've done a little research on that and I'll try to present that to you today. Okay, Squamish, Whistler, Pemberton, uh, really two to three totally different types of marketplaces. Uh, Squamish is very much a mainstream suburban marketplace. Uh, it's buyers, uh, buying, buying is determined largely by interest rates and affordability and housing cost. Uh, it is a distinct marketplace and is heavily influenced by Vancouver as we've already heard, uh, more so in the last couple of years than previous, but uh, some of that is of course due to the boom in the real estate market in Vancouver as people have, as equity has been created and affordability disappeared, people started to look to Squamish as, as, a, as a real alternative. Uh, Whistler is a wealth market, it's a resort market, it's unique, it cannot be measured next to mainstream markets. Uh, decision making is largely made on the basis of lifestyle requirements and wealth and uh, the demand can be heavily influenced by external factors, the kind of things that uh, uh, Helmut talked about where uh, a black swan, as they're known, can occur and everybody runs for a cave and uh, at that point uh, real estate activity disappears. Um, Pemberton uh, is a small town rural market or was until just recently. A very insular to itself, a lot of people living off the grid looking for a much quieter uh, rural environment, recreational type of property. Also primary homeowners, full-time residents, people that are impacted by the cost of housing and thus its uh, values tend to be much more narrowly banded than Whistler. Uh, one thing I think it's important to recognize is all these markets are very small. Uh, you know, the, 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 the media tends to draw on averages, drawn from samples of 10,000 pieces of data. Uh, in Squamish last year, there were 750 trans transactions. Uh, in Whistler, there were 850, and in Pemberton, there was 200. Uh, for the whole year. And it, sometimes it makes the data very volatile when you're trying to come up with a, a number. Uh, so you should be aware of that. The data isn't exhaustive. In small towns, there tends to be a higher percentage of private transactions that occur. We don't get access to the information. Uh, in Whistler, the WHA information is not included in our data. And that is a significant part of the marketplace that goes on here. Um, definitions aren't always consistent either. Uh, I should tell you that when we were looking at the American markets, they lump condominiums and townhouses together. We separate them and see them as distinct housing forms. So uh, it does make the numbers look a little odd at times. Um, one of the things I, uh, I think it's important to recognize is, is that um, all of the things that go on in each community tend to impact the other communities. Uh, one of the obvious examples of this occurred following the Olympics uh, when the resident housing at Chequemus Crossing and Rainbow started to transition into ownership, both Squamish and Pemberton suffered quite badly in terms of activity. Uh, sales fell or were really impacted as compared to what was going on at Whistler at the same time. Uh, another one has been the initiative towards tourism in Whistler uh, has been so successful and has raised occupancy rates and room rates, uh, but what it did was it created an opportunity for Airbnb operators and we saw an explosion of Airbnb operators in both Squamish and Pemberton, which of course had the impact of taking away long-term affordable rental housing in those communities. So to some extent, the decisions that are made in one community can have a real impact, uh, both negatively and positively, on the adjoining communities. And uh, specifically, uh, transportation is one. We're going to see a lot of growth in Squamish, which I'm going to talk to here shortly. Uh, that is something to think about because they're not adding 50 homes. Uh, they're adding a lot more than that. Um, 
So in Squamish, this is a graph you're going to see in a lot of places. Every community looks like this. Probably every community in southwestern British Columbia looks like this. Uh, dollar volume of sales has increased. Unit sales has increased. Uh, as Jordan mentioned, it really took off in 2014. I think that if we were to think back historically, you probably realize that that's when the Vancouver real estate market started to explode. And uh, from that point on, Squamish became a viable alternative for anybody that was looking in the greater metro area for, for housing. And uh, because the housing was very low priced at the time, uh, there was quite an uptick in, in activity. Big developers started to move into Squamish in 2014. We had not seen them prior to 2014. Names like Boza, Polygon, Kirkhoff, Kingswood, Salterra, all major developers in the Vancouver marketplace all of a sudden started taking projects in Squamish where we had never seen them before. What that led to was a significant amount of construction and a huge amount of pre-sale that's going on. Median price has risen dramatically. You can see that it was at $350,000 uh, only five years ago. Uh, quite frankly, for most properties, that was probably a below replacement cost. Uh, since that time, it, it's risen dramatically. At the same time, the number of properties for sale have fallen uh, to the point where uh, right now we have 148 listings in a community with 25,000 people. Uh, needless to say, it's a tight market. Average dollar value, everybody in Squamish is very happy though because the prices have gone up. Their equity has increased, uh, values have improved. Of course, they were real happy until about three weeks ago when their assessment notices all showed up. But uh, in any event, it has been a positive upward mov movement. In my 18 years with Black Tusk, uh, it's the first time we've seen this significant uh, kind of upward movement in pricing in the Squamish marketplace. What's going on now? Uh, historically low resale inventory, as I say, probably uh, if you were looking for a two bedroom condo under $600,000 and went out to look today, you might get to look at two properties. And one of them would be sold by the time you got back to your home. Uh, significant amount of new construction is in process, most of which is pre-sold. Uh, we think that between that and the uh, significant amount of new subdivisions and medium density developments that are being proposed and in process, there's close to 800 units going to be built in the Squamish area uh, and the downtown Squamish area in the next two years. Uh, it's a tremendous number of households. That's not including the four mega projects or five mega projects if you include Garibaldi at Squamish uh, that are in discussions right now. Uh, those properties, that's probably another 2,000 to 3,000 households, not including whatever happens at Garibaldi at Squamish. Uh, it should it happen. Uh, as I say, there are discussions coming up, more discussions coming about that project. Uh, I believe early February is when there is a public hearing in Squamish because there is some more interest in uh, continuing talking about it. Uh, you see there the average price is still pretty good compared to Vancouver. Um, condominiums currently trading $450 to $550 a square foot. Certainly there's some incidences of higher, but that's a good average number. Uh, 148 listings. One of the interesting things that's occurred in Squamish recently is purpose-built rental buildings. Uh, we had never seen those before and there's now one up and two more coming and two more under proposal all in the downtown area on Brownfield development. Uh, I can't give you a total number of units but uh, it is not insignificant. I, one of them is a, actually a 15-story rental building which uh, we'll be interested to see if that goes forward. Uh, we've seen increasing commercial investment uh, Rental rates, as you know, in, in uh, Squamish were very low for a very long time. There was a lot of vacancy. That has essentially disappeared. You will not find high quality lease space in Squamish any longer, either retail or office. There is some B and C space, uh, but uh, essentially uh, we're looking at lease rates in the industrial park between $12 and about $16. Uh, office is running $15 to $25, uh, and retail anywhere from $15 to $35. Uh, all triple net leases, by the way. Uh, investors are lining up to buy properties that are fully leased. Uh, generally, they're looking at 5% cap rates uh, in the Squamish area at this time. Um, future expectations. Uh, their OCP is under review in Squamish, uh, and it would not surprise me in the least if they didn't tap the brakes a little bit on, on growth and development there. Uh, they have an awful lot of uh, projects to manage and bring across the finish line in the next two or three years. And I think uh, adding significant 
significantly more would be a challenge for them resource-wise. Uh, they did do a lot of brownfield development uh, in Squamish up to this point. By brownfield, I mean stuff that had already had buildings on it or had things happen. The ocean front and the waterfront are, are examples of brownfield development. Uh, I think they'll hold off on some greenfield development for the time being. Uh, and Jordan did mention the mega projects south. Um, I think you have to think about those. It's a lot of units. Britannia, 1,000, Furry Creek, certainly only 20% developed. Porto is another one. And then the Garibaldi at Squamish project, which is, is a very large scale development and will be using Highway 99 as much as anybody else will be. There we go. Pemberton, it's a nice picture of downtown. We actually, we're probably one of the few communities that only has one stoplight. And I think we only have three, three stop signs. Um, same graph. Uh, basically, dollar volume has risen steadily. Uh, unit sales have risen steadily since uh, 2012. You see that dip in 2012? That's when Rainbow and Chequemus Crossing transferred. That's when our volume fall, fell off. And uh, it was uh, very slow <laughs> at that time of the year, um, at, at, at that time. Uh, but it's taken off since then, largely due to the fact that there hasn't been a lot of affordable options in Whistler and more and more young families and people that want to own real estate have moved up to Pemberton and are now commuting back and forth or have, uh, uh, have become uh, full-time members of the community. You'll notice that the graph turns down at the top there in 2017. That's a direct result of the fact we had nothing to sell. Um, there's lots of pent-up demand. All my agents in Pemberton will tell you that if they could have uh, 15 more condominiums, we would have them all sold within a week. Uh, there is a real uh, desire to live in that community right now. One thing that is different is that the median prices haven't moved as much there. That's largely due to the, the sample. Uh, in Pemberton, you're either a $250,000 condominium or a $750,000 house, and there isn't really a lot of outliers to that. So the median price just moves within that range. It's only just been this year that we've actually seen a couple of house sales exceed a million dollars. Uh, it, up until just recently, you know, $700,000 was a lot for a single family house in, in Pemberton. Uh, there are no significant outliers, but uh, that is changing and will change as we go forward. Current situation. Uh, this year we released three new subdivisions, all successfully into the community, almost 100 single family lots. Uh, there was a new purpose built rental building uh, put up in the community which again for a small community is, is so solely trading on the fact that there's no rental in Whistler. Uh, there is at least two more, probably three more projects either going to be started or proposed this year, probably another hundred units. Um, the industrial park, I, I don't know how many people have had the chance to drive out to our industrial park. Uh, at one time there was no point, there was nothing there. Um, now, it's a flurry of activity. There's a number of new businesses, new buildings going up. Probably the, the headliner would be the 65,000 square foot organic medical marijuana production facility that's going up in the park, which is A, a an amazing capital investment, but B, is also going to create some jobs in the community. Uh, so uh, I think the commercial situation there, uh, we are underserviced commercially. Uh, currently rates are 15 to 20 bucks a foot, but there is no space that anybody really wants to, live, to operate a business out of we could certainly use some more commercial, uh, commercial space up there. Future development proposals, uh, certainly there are lots of opportunities going forward and I think you might hear about some of that later. Um, we see a lot of movement in the water and, and I think we're going to see some more significant proposals for residential subdivisions and residential uh, properties in the uh, Pemberton area. One thing to keep in mind, um, the village of Pemberton is very constrained physically, steep mountainsides, floodplain and the ALR. So development can only really occur in certain areas which will guide costing and, and locations going forward. Whistler, everybody's favorite topic. I can't go anywhere without people asking me about real estate in Whistler. I get a, I get a sign, who knows. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean really, who knows. Uh, here's the, uh, unlike our American cousins, uh, our response after the Olympics and after the recession was not down. Um, our we basically had a little pause and then away we went. Uh, here you can see that uh, volume steadily increased and uh, dollar volume steadily increased. Uh, again, we've run into no inventory. 
Uh, we don't have anything to sell in 2017. We, we went from 400 listings at the start of the year to, well, currently it's less than 200. Uh, I think a lot of that is due to equity markets. Uh, the equity markets have been on a strong, Whistler is a wealth driven market. Equity markets have been very strong. Wealth has been released and created in Vancouver. Uh, we also have had the remote, uh, the remote worker syndrome, people cashing out of their $4 million or $3 million house in Vancouver and buying a $2 million place in Whistler and saying, I've arrived in heaven. Uh, you know, if you can do that, and there's lots of people that want to do that, the opportunity has never been better than in the last three or four years to do that. So, and, and of course, a slowing number of sales. Uh, and it's directly, again, related to the fact you really don't have anything to sell in the open marketplace. Median price kind of skyrocketed in 2015 and 2016. Uh, that's largely due to a real uptick in activity in the luxury market. Uh, single family housing has had a, a very robust, robust history in the last three years, uh, going from an average price of about a million five to uh, $2.8 million. And so it has uh, affected median, the median value quite significantly. You can see there that we are currently carrying 140 listings uh, I can tell you it's actually less than that because 30 of them are timeshares or fractional type interests, which I don't factor in as being the kind of real estate that uh, for the most part drives our marketplace. Dollar volume of sales, uh, all the categories have had uh, broad improvement. Uh, the only reason that uh, the single family land number is down is that uh, it's a small sample size. And last year, uh, a bulk of the sales were at Wedgwoods, which is a market where the, most of the lots were under a million dollars. If you were to take Wedgwoods out, that curve would go the other way. Unit sales, um, same thing, all restricted by growth until we ran out of things to sell, essentially. Chalet sales, Chalet is, 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 a, is a very consistent market in Whistler. It runs about 120 sales a year, plus or minus. Um, but uh, over the last three or four years, it has become the uh, investment of choice for most people if they can get it. And it, the demand for that has driven prices, as I say, the average, average price is uh, currently $2.8 million for a single family home in Whistler. The median price is 2.2. Uh, there are significant outliers in the housing market uh, because it's a small sample size. If you get three or four $10 million houses change hands, it has a real impact on average numbers. Townhouse supply, same thing, rising prices, increased average prices, fall off in inventory as we've run out of free market housing. Condo sales, uh, that was the one market that seemed to take a bit of a hit uh, following the recession and the Olympics. Uh, I'm not sure why, I have to assume it had something to do with the returns that were being generated. Uh, out of the hotels in 2011, 2012, 2013, it was a bit of a slower period for tourism. Uh, but once that resolved itself and the realization occurred that Whistler wasn't, you know, I, I remember dealing with a, a media person, uh, no offense to the peak, I know they're here somewhere, um, a media person who ha would not let me say that there was nothing wrong with Whistler. The whole point of his article was Whistler was going into the dumps. And I kept saying, well, why? Nothing's changed. Uh, it's simply a perception issue. But where that played out was in the condominium market because they said tourism was falling and people didn't want to, invite, uh, didn't want to invest in the rental condominium. So you saw that dip there. It wasn't a significant dip. And given that condominiums only represent about 19% of the marketplace, uh, it didn't impact the market overall. Uh, as you can see, we're again flattening out uh, towards the top there in terms of activity. Unit sales distribution, people always say to me, Whistler's really expensive, everything's $5 million. Well, that's not actually true. 60% of the market is below a million bucks currently. Uh, however, with the averages moving up the way they've been moving up over the last two or three years, I don't think I'll be able to say that next year. I would say next year the majority of products sold in Whistler will be over a million dollars. Median sales prices, everybody's, everybody's happy. Prices have been going up steadily since 2011. Uh, unlike, unlike the American resorts, we, who saw a big dip in 20, 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, we did not experience that. Our, our housing here, and I think our housing in British Columbia, certainly Helmut could probably tell me if I'm wrong, did not have the kind of reaction to the financial crisis 
that uh, the American marketplaces did. Uh, consequently, uh, in many cases, uh, in, their, in our peer group, if we look at Eagle County or Summit County or, Par or Park City or Tahoe, they are only just recovering to pre-recession levels of activity and price now, basically eight years later. Uh, whereas we have surpassed our previous highs and are, are now at a historical highs in most cases. Unit volume, uh, I think people misconceive the market a little bit here. Uh, Whistler is dominated by medium density format. Townhouses and condominium, it makes up almost 70% of all the transactions that occur here. But all the value is in low density. All the, all the, all the, uh, all the dollar, dollars that are spent are all spent on chalets and on townhouses. It's almost 71% of the marketplace. Uh, so uh, for realtors, what we do is we sell, you know, if we want to sell more units, we have to focus on condos. But really what we really like to sell is houses and expensive pieces of land. Uh, buyer origin, I get this one all the time. Uh, everybody that buys in Whistler is from other, some other place. 70% of all the buyers in Whistler have points of origin west of the Portman Bridge. Uh, it is not filled with international people. We have an international component of roughly 15 to 20% on a year to year basis. Usually about half of that is from the United States. And I would say 75% of that is probably located north of the, uh, uh, the Space Needle in Seattle. Uh, and that is consistent with the, where buyers come from in resort markets. Generally speaking, buyers in resort markets will travel four to five hours maximum to use their home. They may come for a one week visit from farther away, but if they're coming on a repeated basis over the course of a season, a circle about four hours of travel time to five hours travel time away from Whistler will be about as far as the purchaser is prepared to travel every other weekend or every other every weekend and that's not just Whistler that is pretty much true anywhere you look if you go down to Summit County Summit County is where Breckenridge Copper Keystone um, trying to think of the other numbers Pete you probably know what else is there yeah it's about two hours from Denver but flight time from Chicago and 40 million people is four and a half hours, five hours. So they have a huge trading area. We have about six million people between, that are within that four hour range. The Colorado area has 50 to 60 million people. Tahoe has 40 million people. So of course that impacts supply and demand in those marketplaces. Um, I don't think this is going to change. We don't have enough product here for it to change. Uh, so I, I think we'll always have an international feature in the marketplace. Uh, I think you, you need to recognize that it may be focused in some areas, particularly in the, lu in the luxury end, more so than in, in, the, in the more, uh, you know, the Alpines and the Emeralds. They're going to be more on the bench lands and uh, in and around town center. Uh, the one thing that is different this year was the trade up, the activity in Whistler. Uh, where we saw far more activity from Whistler buyers and I have to put that down to uh, as prices have risen here, people uh, actualizing on their equity and selling and then maybe moving into something smaller in the community. Uh, maybe transitioning to uh, condominiums or townhouses, uh, possibly some transition into WHA, although I know that's not permitted, but uh, <laughs> uh, it might have happened once or twice. Uh, current situation, uh, I, it's been talked to, our big, our big initiative going forward here is, is uh, continuing to try to accommodate our resident housing, a um, thousand pillows in the next five years. Uh, for those of you that can't do the math, a thousand pillows is like 350 units. So that'll be done both publicly and privately. Our OCP is hopefully going to be validated uh, in the near future. Commercially, um, rents are going up. I'm sorry all you store owners, but rents are gonna go up. Uh, right now, industrially, uh, we're looking at 16 to $20 a foot, triple net. Uh, B and C space, anywhere between $35 and $55 a foot, and A space, $85 to $150 a foot triple net for office and retail. Uh, many of the leases that are currently in place were signed several years ago, and they are coming up for renewal. So I do not expect that they will go down in the future. I expect they'll be going up. Uh, there's your median sales prices, uh, as you see, 2.2. 487, 945, and a million one. I think we're going to continue going forward, focusing on affordability. 
uh, and resident housing. Uh, there is no real significant planned free market housing on the books right now. Uh, one project in Blueberry that I'm aware of uh, and one project down in Chequemus, but not a heck of a lot more. Um, I think we're going to continue to assess opportunities, though. Uh, and when I think of that, I think of the Whistlerview Hotel, which has recently been converted into a new Pangea Pod Hotel. That kind of reframing of existing assets, I think, is something that we will continue to investigate as a community. Other resorts, Eagle County. Everybody says, well, with Vail coming to town, it's going to raise our prices. Well, no, probably not. Um, it certainly will increase our awareness of, uh, internationally. But uh, currently, other than the Vail Village, where the average price of a home is $12.5 million, and the average price of a townhouse is about $2.5 million US, uh, and Beaver Creek and Bachelor Gulch, uh, which are comparable to us in values, uh, we are higher than all the other areas listed there, uh, both in terms of townhouses and in terms of single family. Uh, Park City is the next closest. Uh, the median value of a transaction in Park City proper, which is the area based around Deer Valley, it's at about 8,000 people, um, is $2 million. Their condominiums run in the four to $5 million, uh, $500,000 range. Uh, one thing you should be aware of, uh, right now in Whistler, uh, condominiums and townhouses are probably priced and selling at $1,000 a foot just about anywhere you look. In these communities, outside of the Vale Village uh, and Beach, uh, Beaver Creek and Bachelor Gulch, you're really not seeing anything above $750 a square foot uh, for the sales of medium density real estate. The other thing to be aware of is it, these are big trading areas. Eagle County is 55,000 people, 32,000 homes. Uh, Park City, 32,000 people. Tahoe is huge. It's a summer resort as well as a winter resort. So, uh, Park and, and Summit, I'm not clear exactly how big Summit is, but I think it's not far off what Eagle is in terms of number of people. That would be like us taking Squamish, Whistler, and Pemberton and combining all of that data to approach what they're doing. Uh, Eagle County last year sold $2 billion worth of real estate and they had 1,800 transactions occur. Uh, so, they are different marketplaces and making, uh, and making comparisons can be a little challenging. Factors to consider going forward, these have been covered extensively by Helmet. Interest rates in Squamish and Pemberton are certainly, affordability is certainly an issue and cost of housing is certainly an issue. Equity markets, uh, anything that affects the equity markets affects Whistler. Uh, so, think about that. Construction costs. I've talked about a lot of potential construction coming in the next two years. Quite frankly, I, and I know there's some contractors in the room. I don't think there's enough contractors to meet the demand. Uh, and that can't do anything but drive up prices and possibly make uh, things less affordable and also make some projects unfeasible. Uh, there is just not enough sub-trades, not enough general contractors for what appears to be in the neighborhood of 1,000 units going to be built in the corridor in the next couple of years. Macro policies, Helmut spoke about NAFTA. Government taxation, uh, I am concerned that the next provincial government has something up their sleeve for real estate. Uh, certainly a speculation tax has been, a trial balloon has gone out about that. Uh, and then I saw one today on bear trusts. I know that's a fairly sophisticated tool, uh, but it does in the commercial markets and in the wealth markets, bear trusts are a vehicle that is used a lot. And uh, they seem to be wanting to approach, do something about that. So I expect in February we'll be watching closely Oversaturation, uh, certainly anecdotally we are hearing comments about you know, how much is too much, at what point do we reverse how wonderful this is and do, isn't it really busy and I'd rather not go. And that's a problem for both tourism and real estate. Vancouver factor, as Whistler goes, as Vancouver goes, so goes Whistler. If the Vancouver real estate market collapses, I don't think we'll see anywhere near as much demand here. And despite the fact we are seeing more interest from foreign buyers, there aren't enough of them to fill the gap if the Vancouver market disappears. Uh, going forward, we may see more foreign buyer influence, but until we have more product, their impact on the marketplace uh, will be slow and gradual. Finally, uh, finally, I know Mo's waving at me. Finally, uh, <laughs> sellers will sell, buyers will bell, buy. Buyers determine value, not sellers. Sorry, all you sellers. Buyers determine value, and they determine it based on on what they, their perception of value is, both in the property and in the, in, the, in the community that they're moving into. So relative value is extremely important. Uh, it's always going to be a, a, a function of supply and demand. That seems self-evident, 
but when I tell you there's no supply and demand is consistent and growing, I think you can reach the conclusion that prices are likely going to go up. Uh, we see no re reason whatsoever for interest in any of the communities to stop, to slow down. Uh, it is still a beautiful place to live. It is still a wonderful jumping off spot for those of us that love the mountains and love recreation. Uh, so I don't see that stopping. I do see the number of transactions dropping simply because we don't have anything to sell. Um, I see a moderation in value increases. Uh, we've gone through three years of double digit appreciation. Uh, any good economist would tell you that that's not sustainable in the long run. So I expect we'll see some flattening of, of value increases. Uh, and houses will probably stay on the market longer because we're getting more and more expensive and there are fewer and fewer buyers at the higher price ranges. Uh, finally, there is going to be significant residential and commercial, commercial growth and potential opportunity on either side of Whistler in real estate. Uh, there will be lots of opportunities in Whistler, but it just won't be in real estate investment. Finally, one last thing that I will bring to your attention. Um, this is probably doesn't concern you as much as it concerns me, but on March the 15th, uh, the rules and regulations for how real estate licensees practice their profession are going to change fundamentally. Uh, in essence, the uh, practice of having one agent represent a buyer and a seller in a transaction will end. Uh, it is actually the first time in Canada this has occurred, and it may very well be the first time in North America that it has occurred. Um, it's obviously meant for consumer protection, but I think it's going to be a bit of a bumpy road initially as we all work out our new relationships and we add to the already uh, intimidating stack of paper that is part of our process. Uh, there's going to be a lot more forms to sell, uh, to sign, uh, uh, reflecting uh, your, uh, your work with a realtor. So uh, uh, please work with us on that. It's not that we don't want to work with you. It's that in some cases we may not be able to legally. So that is what I have to say. Uh, I did mention they are going into an o they are in an OCP review. The question was, uh, they're not their amenities aren't keeping up with their uh, residential growth, uh, and, and I, I certainly would second that. Um, much of their public amenity space, uh, you know, community centers, that sort of thing, uh, they seem to be leaving that, uh, particularly the activity parts of it, to the private enterprise side, and they're not doing public stuff. But I expect that that is one of the things when they tap the brake tap the brakes on development in Squamish, um, they may start to look at some more of the community and livability issues. Um, like everything, everything if, you, if you're going to scale up on one side, you have to scale up on the other side, whether it's infrastructure or community amenities. And, um, you know, I think they maybe got a little ahead of themselves residentially, uh, which has been great for them because it's created, brought all kinds of new people into town with new levels of energy. Uh, the Squamish uh, business community is uh, incredibly vibrant, full of young people, very creative, lots of new ideas. Uh, and so they are going through some growing pains, just as we did here not that long ago, where, you know, oh, gee, we, we need this, we need a park, we need some other things. And, and their leaders, I'm sure, will find a way to start thinking about how to do that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Pat. No problem. Thank you very much.